Hi everyone, uh, my name is Swati Kankan. I work with Kanan Animal Welfare um, as the Director of Partnerships. Uh, cause a rescue organization in New Delhi, India, and we work uh, on critical care rescue cases. I have with me today uh, Jill Trail, who is a volunteer with Operation Pause for Homes, which is a rescue organization in the United States. Uh, OPH primarily rescues dogs in crowded shelters in the southern part of the U.S. and finds adoptive homes for them in Washington, D.C. area. OPH also brings a small number of former street dogs from India, well known as the Desi Dog Program. All of the dogs they bring from India come from Kaw in New Delhi. Uh, Jill has been a foster uh, many, many times and has a lot of experience as one. Well. We're using today's session to talk about fostering, to talk about fostering Desi dogs in particular, how it can impact you as a person and what you need to kind of keep in your in head while you're doing this. Um, so Jill, would you like to take over from here? Can you tell us about your current foster? I actually uh, just picked a foster up last night. Um, not a daisy dog, obviously, because of the borders being closed right now. So um, we're all real hopeful that's going to change soon. But she's a little chihuahua, just a little little thing. And she was part of a puppy mill. And um, I, if you're not familiar with what that is, that's people who basically keep lots and lots of dogs and they breed them over and over and over again for the purpose of selling the puppies and earning money on it. And it's um, usually not the best circumstances for those dogs. So she was a puppy mill chihuahua and she's adorable. Her little tongue just doesn't fit her mouth. It hangs out the side, but very under socialized. She was kept in a teeny tiny little box and that was her life. Um, so now she's here. Um, she's actually over there sleeping kind of half watching me with one eye open, but so that's one foster. And then I have another foster kind of came from similar circumstances, except that he's a male dog and um, he's a, a miniature pincher mixed breed. And again, with the extremely under socialized, he's great with other dogs, but fearful of people. So I'm um, slowly working on gaining his trust. And that's what I'm going to do with these two particular fosters is um, give them lots of love and gain their trust to the point where they can be adoptable. All right. So can you tell us a little bit about how you started fostering? I was actually, I adopted a dog through OPH um, a couple years ago. And then we were having a, a hurricane that was coming through one of our southern um, states um, in this country. And usually the shelters get overwhelmed with dogs when people are in crisis because they can't care for themselves, let alone their dogs. So I thought, well, now might be a good time to volunteer to foster. And of course, OPH was like, yes, we always need fosters. So that's how it started with a hurricane down that was supposed to come across, uh, I think, South Carolina about two years ago. And um, so that's how it started, because I figured they would be inundated with um, dogs and actually it worked out pretty good. It didn't happen as bad as they thought, but it got me started. And here I am. <laughs> So can you talk a little bit about fostering as a concept so people who are watching this can understand how it helps us? Oh, yes. Um, yes. Having these dogs that are in sh you know, shelter environments, I mean, of course, they're getting cared for, but they're not getting the uh, living in a home, individual attention, um, getting used to the television and the vacuum cleaner and, you know, kids and, you know, going out in the yard and playing and come back and come, you know, come back in there. They're, all those things, the shelters do the best they can, but they're, the, the dogs that are in those shelters aren't given those opportunities because, um, you know, it's basically a, a triage. I mean, you do your best to take care of the volume of dogs within the shelter. So by having fosters, you can um, bring those dogs out of the shelters and um, give them an environment where it's, it, you know, a home and, and ready them for adoption. And then, of course, that gives the shelter more room to bring in more dogs that, you know, otherwise might um, either be feral dogs or in a bad environment um, or may not get a chance at all because there's no room for them. So they're uh, ultimately euthanized because there's no room for them in the shelter. So being a foster, um, is a domino effect down the line, um, for sure. It helps not just the dog you're fostering, but many, many others. It's like the front line. You're kind of making space for all the other dogs in need. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very important. It's actually not very common in India. Uh, people tend not to go for fostering 
which is also why we wanted to do a session like this because it's so important for people to understand why this is something that they should get into why it's something that benefits so many animals why rescues keep asking for posters so uh, all right so why don't fosters adopt their dogs this particular question i think is asked a lot like oh if the dog is happy with you then why don't you just adopt it so can you kind of explain over there why uh, a foster will not always adopt a dog they have um it does happen on occasion um but you know if i adopted my fosters that would leave no room for fosters so um and again that that trickle down effect of helping the other dogs um it, it would kind of it would put a hiccup in that. So, um, you know, in, when my fosters come to me, um, and some of them are, are in pretty good shape and others not so much, they're sick, um, and they get healthy and they get happy and you see them kind of evolve and bloom. And then you follow their story onto their new family. And um, that and within itself is extremely rewar very rewarding. You don't have to have the dog in your house to still have a connection to the dog. Um, right. So, you know, I follow a lot of my fosters and um, it's, it's very uh, gratifying. It's a, it's a very feel good thing. And then, of course, that leaves the door open for another foster and the story begins again. So, right. So you told me uh, the last time we spoke that it's like expanding your own family because um, the foster dog that goes to a new family, they become part of your own family. So you feel like you, you're growing your network. <clears throat> you're getting to know more people and you're connecting with more people, which I found it's just a very nice way of thinking about it. It was. It, and that's true. I have made um, so many friends and like you said, expanded my family, um, you know, and during this time, this pandemic, you know, these things are important for your, your, your health, your mental health uh, as well. So, um, you know, the fostering program, yes, it, it benefits the dog, but it definitely, I feel has benefited me. I have made, incredible friends, uh, you know, through all of this. And I feel like I, I belong somewhere and there's, you know, a group that I, I fit into. So it's, it's been wonderful. All right. So, um, what are the basics that someone should think of, uh, before they start fostering? Like what, what should they keep in mind? Um, as far as their home goes, or as far as, uh, First thing, if you want to, if you want to foster, the first thing you need to think about is, you know, what rescue you want to work with. Um, I work with uh, Operation Paws for Homes, and they are an amazing organization. I, I can't, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, I've had nothing but positive experiences with them, and it's been almost two years, um, year and a half, almost two years since I've been um, volunteering for them. Not to mention, I had previously adopted um, through them. So the thing is, is find a reputable uh, rescue that you can build a relationship with, that's organized, and that has the, um, that can back you up and answer your questions and help you. Um, with different scenarios and, and preparation for having a foster. And each foster is a little different. So, you know, one what works for one foster, you might have to modify and, you know, for another foster. And if your organization is is very familiar with dog and dog behavior and their needs and their background, um, and they have a lot of volunteers that can, it's like OPH has several different volunteers that kind of have their little niches, their little specialties, um, and some are behavioralists. You know, I can email and say, you know, I have this question about this dog or a medical problem. I can email that account and say, um, hey, Tracy, you know, I'm, I have a concern. This dog is urinating and there's some blood in her urine. You know, what do you recommend? What do I do? Um, so make sure that you have the, the, the backing um, for fostering if you're going to go through an organization. Rick. I mean, it's very important to have that support because, you know, without it, um, if you have questions, if you're confused about what to do, then you're kind of at a loss, right? Especially for someone who's new to the entire uh, system. Yes. If you if you don't have a history with animals, um, it, it is so helpful to have people to, to talk you through. Well, this is normal. You know, the dog, you know, this is or this is this is not normal. This, you know, if you're you know, medically speaking, I mean, what would you know? there's people out there that do know. So um, yes, it's really, the support is important, sure. 
Right. And of course, as you gain knowledge, then you start becoming the support. So that, right. you know, as you learn and gain, you know, the next thing you know, you're the one helping and answering questions, which is, is, is again, part of the journey and, and it growing. Of course. Um, so what should, okay, so we have your basics that like you need to know who you want to work with, right? But what should you be prepared for? Like, if you're bringing a dog home, what should you prepare yourself mentally for? What you, should you physically prepare yourself for as well? Uh, just like some basics that people can uh, think about. So if I, you know, I, I am able to um, see what dogs are coming available that need fosters. So they give you an idea of the, the, the sex of the dog, the medical needs of the dog, the size of the dog, um, and a little bit of the history if they can. So like last night um, before I went to transport to pick up my newest foster, she's just a little teeny thing. Um, I made sure that I had a, a crate ready for her, you know, fresh bedding, water. Um, so when I got her home, you know, I could just tra transfer her in. Um, I made sure I had the right equipment, you know, leashes, collars that fit her properly. It's kind of hard to guess because, again, you don't know the dog. But from the pictures, I'm able to prepare ahead of time. Um, for you know, what equipment she needs. And um, so, so, so there's that. And I, you know, because I have other dogs here, I make sure that I have areas just for her until the dogs get to know each other. So I have like literally like a little, little fence that, you know, is around her area so she can come out of her crate if she wants and, and interact through that fencing with my personal dogs, plus my other foster dog, um, Simon. So safety, you know, you want to protect your resident animals if you have any, and you want to protect the uh, foster because you don't know personalities if they're gonna, if they're gonna clash um, or or not. Especially if you're bringing a strange dog into your house, you don't know anything, you know, how reactive they could or, you know, or passive or aggressive they might be. So you want to make sure that your family too, if you have children, um, that they're not. Uh, thrown in a situation where with a strange dog that you don't know how that dog's going to react. So, um, yeah, so make sure you have obviously food for the dog, bedding for the dog, um, put your properly fitting equipment, um, and an area where that dog can be, where it can kind of watch, watch your world and learn and, you know, talk to your other animals in the house through, you know, a, a gate or fenced in area and, you know, gradually do those introductions. And, and same with your family, educate your children. Don't go sticking your hand in there. You don't know this dog. So. Yeah. Actually educating children about how to properly interact with dogs is so important. I feel like it's, people put a lot of onus on the dog. Like the dog should know how to interact with children, that, but the child should also know how to interact with the dog. That in itself could be a whole nother dog spot conversation. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So a lot of, it's what I call the avoidable tragedy. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. you know, there's things you can do to avoid these things happening. So right, right. Okay. Uh, so when we had last spoken, you had kind of told us about the concept of a foster mentor, which we found very interesting. So can you just elaborate on what that is? I will do my best. Um, yes. So you know, I obviously started out as a foster, and as I had dogs come through, you gain, you gain experience, like we said earlier, um, and more knowledge, you have a, a better knowledge base. And then of course, you learn the system for the rescue that you're volunteering for. So you learn their ins and outs and their system. And, um, and then when more people come on board that say, hey, you know, I, I'm interested in fostering, they say, we'll connect you with this experienced foster, and she can help answer your questions and guide you. Um, so they asked me if I would do that. Um, gosh, I don't know, it's been I guess about six months now. Uh, and wow. I have, um, I think three, three or four people that um, I mentor. And so if they run into some, like I had one person call me, I have this foster, I just picked it up tonight. It's terrified. It ran under my deck. I can't get it out. So, <laughs> so of course then, you know, my job is to find somebody because he lived too far away from me for me to get out there to help. So of course I start networking who can go out and help get this little dog, you know, that's wedged way under his oh, deck and can't reach out. And, you know, so sure enough, I mean, people just jump right into action and um, they, they were able to get the dog out with, uh, it took a little bit of time, but without any drama, you know, there wasn't cutting holes in the deck or anything. They just <laughs> brought another, they brought another dog and they brought food and they just slowly but surely coaxed it until they could get to a point where they could, could get a, get a, a leash around it safely and, and bring it the rest of the way out. 
So, and then, or um, they'll call or text and say, um, my dog has an appointment with an adopter. What do I need to make sure that I have ready? What do I need to do? So you're able to, you know, talk them through that. Um, or they say, well, you know, my dog, I had a, a, um, a foster uh, ask me the other day. She says, my dog pants all the time and I've had it for a couple of weeks and I just, you know, it's just the panting sometimes gets really labored. I'm like, a contact medical, it sounds like to me, it could be X, Y, Z, confirm that with medical, or, you know, it might just be, you know, just the dog, but I was, it, it wasn't a, that it concerned me that I did have her contact medical. Um, so that's the kind of things, or, Hey, I have these medications. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with them or, right. um, you know, it's, it's any variety of questions that they have, they have come to me with, um, I've been pretty much able to answer. And when I'm not, I'm able to direct them to the person that can answer the question. Right. Oh, I think that's excellent because, I mean, one of the reasons that a lot of people here don't foster is because, well, they don't know how to go about it. And it's always a lot of organizations tend to kind of give you the dog and disappear. So it becomes your responsibility to figure out what to do, how to do it. If there's an issue, you're kind of left hanging. And that is just it's just the worst way to go about fostering uh it's it not is. a good way to encourage fosters either so like we have a very well as you know we're a little crazy about our own dogs so we're always like yes be in touch tell us if you have any questions or something that we can help with and yeah so this is the sort of thing that i feel would be so helpful in india like having a few experienced people kind of guiding a few others mm -hmm. and you can kind of spread it from there well, again, it gets back to, you know, as a person doing your homework, you know, for an organization, find out, ask the questions. Um, okay. What kind of support do you have? Do you supply food for this animal? Which our organization actually does. Doesn't mean that others can, um, right. depending on the volume of dogs that they have and their funding. Um, but uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think, again, it's, it's really important to have the backing so you're not out there alone and then you get frustrated with the experience then you don't do it anymore so these um, organizations need to step up and back their fosters and, yeah. and the fosters need to um, commit and, and it is it's you know it's a commitment you can't just change your mind that's just not fair to the animal and um, you certainly aren't going to get the uh, the reward in the end with again the relationships that you build with the dog and with the community and and the people within the organization yeah that's true which kind of takes us to our next question which is how do you find the perfect foster um, <laughs> what do you do to find the perfect foster well there's you know there's no perfect foster we're all you know we do the very best that we can i think um the fosters need to definitely have um the time and in even the space, like I've kind of dedicated my, my kitchen area and I have a fenced yard, which is really helpful, but that's probably, you know, a, a luxury for some people. So, um, but yeah, just the, 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 the space, the time, the heart and commitment um, and go into it knowing that, that you're not just giving to the animal that you are definitely going to get back. So just follow through with it. Um, and if you have a bad experience with fostering with either an animal or with an organization, don't stop there. There's wonderful people out there. Um, and it really, it renews, it renews your, your, your faith in humanity when you really connect with the right people doing this. Um, Cause again, you know, it's very difficult times right now. And, and, uh, so don't if you have a if you have a bad experience as a foster or you get a dog and and, and the the you know you just don't know what to do um, don't don't give up it's it, it takes time like I have a foster right now he's been in my house for three weeks he was the Simon I was telling you his uh, adopt yeah. adopted his uh, OPH name is remembering neuron but. Simon's easier for me to call, you know. <laughs> so um, the Simon, remembering Neuron is his rescue name. But um, he's been here with me for three weeks, three weeks. And um, I have yet to be able to pet him. And but where he was on day one and where he is now is we have moved forward. And so you can't just 
get a dog and overnight think that dog's going to come bounding to you and love you like you see, you know, on these videos right. on the internet. It doesn't always work that way, but it, you'll get there. Just, just give it time. Your intention and your heart is known to you. It's not known to the animal. Um, right. Give the, the animal time to recognize that and learn that. Yeah, I think that's a expectation frequently that, oh, you know, the dog is going to be really happy to see me and the dog is going to run into my arms. And I'm just like, no, the dog doesn't know who you are, you know, uh, let the dog get comfortable with you. And I'm sure the dog will want to do all of but, these things. And, and those are unreasonable expectations. They just are. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, every it's now and then it. you get the you get that dog, you know, that's well, <laughs> but, you know, it's a very unreasonable expectation. So again, if you just take your time with the journey, then the reward is tenfold because when you finally get there with that dog, it's like, look, you know, I committed and I, I dedicated and, and look where this, this dog is now. He's happy, he's healthy, well-adjusted. Um, so yeah, don't, don't let those feel good videos fool you because a lot of times these people put a lot of time into these animals to bring them along and it's a four minute right. video segment, you know, so yeah, you to, you've gone through that work. It, it is wonderful, you know, feel good and warm and fuzzy, but it's not necessarily, um, it, it's the reality, but it takes way yeah, longer yeah. than you, than the, con the concept, you know, the, 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 what, the what's projected, so. Absolutely, absolutely. It is a great feeling, though, like, uh, when you fostered a puppy and then you see, like, a few months later, you just see that dog in their new home. And you're just like, oh, man, if I wasn't there, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And I could do this again. I could help another dog and do this again. Uh, I, I think. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I was, I've abs absolutely had that experience where I, I picked a, a, an older dog from a rescue and, and I knew that um, these dogs, he was heartworm positive, which you, I don't think you really have an issue in India with heartworms like we do here, but they're literally a, a parasite that, that gets in their pulmonary system, vascular system. Yeah. And it's, disgusting and they fill up their heart yeah, and eventually they die you know so this oh poor guy God. was heartworm positive he was so sick and I volunteered to foster him and he there's no doubt in my mind he would have been euthanized because the 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 um the the shelter down there didn't have the funding to treat him number one and because of his age he was considered a, a senior dog and he was actually like six or seven years old which to me is not oh. senior but that qualifies as senior so they're like uh, you know low adoptability is what he was considered plus with his health issues and he was a surrender um they they tend to 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 not invest the time in dogs that are, are voluntarily surrendered and could have been any number of reasons why this dog was brought to the shelter maybe the family didn't have the money to treat him who, who knows um right. so i took him and he was so sick he was just so sick when he came here he just panted all the time the only way I could get him comfortable was to put a fan in front of his crate and he had just this horrible sinus infection and um so he stayed with me through his treatments and everything and he was with me about two months and he got adopted and he's my happiest feel-good story she sends me pictures all the time and he plays and he chases balls and swims and he was so sick he could barely walk around my kitchen when he first came so those are that's definitely one of the ones I know he wouldn't be here right now if I hadn't if OPH hadn't offered him for you know to re to rescue and and I hadn't said, yes, I'll foster him. I mean, it definitely started with the, with OPH, the rescue saying, you seeing a dog in need and asking, you know, their volunteers. So I'm sure that dog would not, would not be with us now along right. with many others, but this one, I have no doubt. You know, sometimes you just don't know what their fates are going to yeah. be, you know, and yeah. this one, I have no doubt. This is a great example of how like fostering actually changes lives, you know, like people, I feel like people kind of take it for like, oh, you know, someone else will do it and it's not that big a deal. And only if I'm adopting, like, am I really saving a life? And this is a great, this, this explains how you can save a life through fostering. I think it's great. It's wonderful. Yes, um, and definitely, no doubt. <clears throat> a lot of dogs don't do that well in uh, a shelter environment. Like, Something like a skin issue, for example, that can take a little longer to clear up in a shelter because there's a lot of other dogs that needs a little bit more of individual care, um, all of that. So, sorry. That's okay. My bird's been squawking in the background. So, <laughs> my, my, I am in another room. My dogs are in another room so that, you know, like, 
focus can happen. <laughs> well, I'm in my <laughs> kitchen with my dogs, hoping that'll keep them quiet, but I can hear my bird in the next room over. As soon as I get on the phone, she has something to say. So she's been chirping. I keep hearing her. So hopefully it's not too distracting for everybody. I can't hear it at all. If that helps. Oh, good. Oh, good. Cause she's been putting on quite the show over there. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So uh, the entire idea, uh, I think maybe fostering isn't shown as you see, like, in the US, I feel you've developed like a foster network, a community of fosters that supports rescue organizations. That's not so done here, right? So one of the things I've been trying to do and CAW has been trying to do is like create that community where we have reliable fosters that we know that we can depend on, they know we they can depend on us and we just work together and you know get things done. So it's definitely something India needs that we're working on very hard right now. Well, interesting. Um, you get one foster, then that foster might, you know, have a friend. Hey, you know, this is this is my foster dog, you know, Boo Boo. Uh, you should try this, and then we really enjoy it. And these are experiences we have, experiences we've had with it. So, you know, hopefully, like word of mouth will help also generate um, some people in interest right. in in getting that's more how fosters. It spreads. Yeah, it, it's like a domino effect. That's how you get more people on board. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, networking. You know, that's you know the, that and that friend tells a friend and the next thing you know there's you know so yeah that you know in, in networking is a very important tool yeah, to definitely. be used so uh what like i know you have two fosters right now and uh, two other dogs two of your own yes i have um yeah. a dachshund and yeah. um i don't know his name is doug and then i also have a daisy dog that's from your foundation call and she's uh, actually a special needs dog. She uh, doesn't have her hind legs. She was hit by a car as a puppy and uh, as a result, spinal fractures. And then, you know, the, and then the process, you know, the dragging her legs causes infection. So she had one leg amputated while she was with you. And then when she came here, it was decided that the remaining leg was actually hindering what mobility she yeah. had. Um, so it was decided to remove the second leg. So she's a double amputee in the rear. And um, yeah, that dog, she, nothing slows her down. She, we go out for a walk. I taught her, I taught her how to use a wheelchair. We go out for a walk. I, I think I'm gonna have to take up jogging or something. I can't keep up. <laughs> so she's amazing and her personality. So yeah, she's a Daisy dog. Her name is Pihu. Um, and so she, I fostered her. She was my second special needs dog from Carl. And um, so I kind of kept her. <laughs> She was <laughs> the foster fail that we try to discourage. <laughs> no, it happens though. Sometimes there is just like there there are these specific dogs who you have that bond with, and when you meet them, you're like, okay, this is for me. This is one of this is one of the bonds that I need. You know, right? Like that, and that's true. Say. She feeds my soul. She absolutely feeds my soul. Um, but you know, I also decided that you know by keeping Pihu, I was not going to let that inhibit my ability to foster dogs so right. you know where I might have had you know my dog and two fosters now I have my two dogs and my two fosters <laughs> like, you know, right, right, you, know right. you just kind of adjust you know and so yeah right, right. so uh, the question actually was is there any maximum number of dogs one foster can have so <laughs> I, you know, I think that really depends on that person and their um living space and you know I you know some people can only manage one dog at a time depending on you know where they live and who lives in their house with them or not or the size of the dog um and then there's other people's that people's yeah good or grammar there's other people that are really set up to to manage multiple dogs um we have fosters that bring in pregnant dogs and whelp them or let the, the mothers have their babies at their home. Um, and they're just like, they're just so organized and they have everything set up perfectly. So right. it really depends on the person. Um, no, there's no maximum. It just depends on who you are and, and, and your abilities and um, your time and, and yeah. what you're willing to do. So I sometimes have like, actually, I have two fosters right now, and I'll be getting a third foster next Friday. So I'll have five dogs here, which is kind of my max, my personal maximum. Um, but it, yeah, and, and it can depend on the dogs, too. The reason I'm able to have so many right now is because the ones I happen to have are small. And that 
it's more manageable. Um, right. The one I'm getting next Friday is actually a little bit bigger dog. If I had three St. Bernards here, you know, Great Danes, that would be too much for me. Um, so, but there are other people that love the big dogs and they have the space, they have the yard, they have the house. And, you know, so it's, it's a really, it's an, it's, it's a matter of that person and, um, their comfort and what they want to take on. Um, right. so yeah, it's just, so yeah, there would, there would be so many factors actually that you would consider here, like your own experience, your house, your, mm -hmm. who else lives with you, the mm -hmm. dog, the dog's mm -hmm. needs, the, yeah, but we, I mean, for any for for a first timer, generally we would say start with one dog, see how that goes, and then see what where you feel you can go from there. But yeah, starting slow I think is very important because we also don't want a situation where you kind of take on more than you can chew, like and mm -hmm. you're just kind of floating around trying to figure out the situation. Yeah, that well, would be difficult. Yeah, certainly if you're a first time foster, I would not encourage you to take on a pack. <laughs> pack of dogs. Um, yeah, just one, one, you know, and um, learn and then, you know, move on to the next dog. Because again, it's, it's, it's a huge letdown for the animal and disruptive for them. If you get four or five days into it, and you just throw up your hands, I can't do this and send the dog somewhere else. Because every time you do that, it just disrupts that flow. And it's the dog gets there's a setback for the dog and yes they'll they'll come back from it but the the if we can minimize that that's ideal right it's yeah that that's actually um a lot of people approach call for fostering and they say we can foster for a week and i say that's that's not going to do anything you know like we do a six weeks minimum foster because it takes the dog at least two weeks to adjust you know like the dog at it, least we need to, yeah so I was like, after two weeks, you'll see some improvement there. You'll see some confidence, some comfort developing. But if you're, if you just keep the dog for those two weeks, the dog spends two weeks adjusting and then you send it back. And that just makes no sense. Yeah. Ideally, I mean, fosters should think about if they're taking on a foster, the idea is to have the foster until the foster finds a permanent home. Yes, absolutely. So uh, that could be, I've had dogs here for seven days and poof, they found their home. And I've had dogs here longer that, you know, just the right person didn't come along. And, and, you know, I don't go into it with the expectation of, well, I'm going to have this dog for a couple of days and then it's going to get adopted or I'm going to send it back. No, I, when I take on a foster, especially with dogs like Simon, I know I'm in it for the long haul and that's okay. Cause you know, that's my expectation. I'm aware of that. So right. to have an expectation of a, a, a short duration is not realistic. It's not. And it's also, it can be a little damaging for the dog uh, as well. It, it just hinders our work too, because, you know, we're stressing that, oh no, like they're going to come back and it's going to be difficult for them. And then we need to find another foster and it's, it's, yeah. a whole it's, 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 it's not helpful um, exactly. to have, to have a dog go into a home for a brief period of time and then, then go back to the shelter. Cause it, it, it yeah, rocks, it rocks their little world. It took them out of their comfort zone, which was the shelter, puts them somewhere else and maybe they're starting to get comfortable. And then they're thrown back into the environment they came from. Um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not real productive. Yeah, it's not, it's not definitely. Um, so I know OPH has its own procedures for finding fosters, finding adopters, everything. So what are the kind of qualifications? Like what are you, you, I mean, I'm guessing it's not like one checklist and yeah, if you have everything, then you can keep a dog, but like, uh, what are, what are some things that you look at and you require from a potential foster? Well, if somebody sees a dog, um, through OPH, whether, you know, cause there's different, there's different, uh, ways of, of letting the community know that we have these dogs up for adoption, but let's say, you know, Jane Doe says, oh, I really like this dog, Fruithy. She can fill out an application, which is going to um, help us learn more about her um, in the application. It talks about where you live, you know, what you do for a living, because if you're gone, you know, several hours a day, like 12 hours a day at your job, and there's nobody else in your house, that's not a, that's not ideal circumstances. So, you know, some personal information, who lives in the house, what you do, um, what your history with animals are, you know, if you've had his, if you had had dogs, if you have dogs or cats now, 
um, because not all dogs get along with cats. So it kind of helps us pair the dog with the person. So um, we do some information gathering on that person. And then we ask for references. So, you know, Jane wants, you know, Froofy and she has her friend Fred and George and Bob and Fred and George and Bob all have wonderful things to say about her. That helps us um, know more okay. about, again, about the adopter. A potential adopter. And um, if you do have pets in the house, we want to know that your animals are current on their vaccinations and their uh, parasite preventative and that they are spay or neutered because we don't want to work backwards and make more babies that defeats the right. purpose here. Um, and it shows a level of responsibility uh, for the adopter towards their animals for us, you know. And then um, once all those things, questions are answered, um, uh, there's another role that I play with uh, OPH and I, I don't do it very often because it, it, it's, it's hard with my job to commit to, but it's called adoption coordinating where I will call that potential adopter and I'll do a phone interview with them and I'll talk to them about what they can expect um, as an adopter from you know, a dog and from the organization and the support that we offer, um, any fees involved and I explain that they have, you know, the dogs will come to them completely, you know, medically sound, well, not medically sound, but with vaccinations, um, parasite treatment, you'll have all those records to give to your vet. And yes, ideally there'll be medical sound, but sometimes there's yeah, just they're, they're things happen. Reasons. You just don't know. Um, yeah. but at any rate, so they have all those records, um, that they'll be able to take to their veterinarian. So I tell them, you know, so I explain to them what they can expect from us and what we expect from them, which is you can't just give the dog away. You're signing a contract. If for some reason your circumstances change, you're not able to keep the dog, you return the dog to the organization. Um, and so we'll again find a foster for the dog. And you know, it happens on occasion, not very often, but sometimes people's circumstances really change or they have health crisis and they can't care for the dog. So you cannot just give the dog away or take it to a shelter. You have to return it to the organization. We make, you know, we have to find a contract um, with that. So at any rate, um, so then we try to find the personality. Like if, you know, I have, Jane's looking for a chihuahua and you know, I'm not going to connect her with the foster that has a great thing. So <laughs> you say you learn, you know, what they're looking for and personality wise and you're, and so you're able to make a better match. But um, so that's, yeah. So they go through the adoption process, application interviews, and then they can get on our website and look and see what dogs we have available. And, you know, we have bio, bio write-ups from the fosters about, you know, what these dogs are like. Um, some are more playful than others. Some are younger. Some are older. Some get along with other dogs. Some do not. You know, so they're able to um, go through and, and and figure out kind of what they're looking for, um, hopefully to make a better match and for a life commitment, you know, to the animal. So, um, yeah, Did that answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a it's a similar procedure to what we do locally uh, with our rehoming though uh, as you know local rehoming like for our dogs has become a little difficult because our dogs are older they might have some sort of a disability and people in India for some reason don't love our desi dogs as much as our desi dogs love them so um, yeah it's definitely a procedure that we follow and it's they good don't know what they're missing here. the daisy dogs I mean, are I think amazing so. <laughs> yeah they have the best personalities they they just they're definitely different than your americanized dogs because you know yeah. these dogs that are here um not all you know all these dogs were obviously not bred in this country but you know you have a dog that's bred for specific purposes like golden retrievers go yeah. retrieve and bring it back. You know, my dachshund was bred to chase a badger down a hole where Daisy dogs, they've done this themselves. They, they, you know, what, why they have existed and continue to exist is no human um, influence. And yeah. so the personalities are um, complex and, and interesting and quirky and fun. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, what's, what's, yeah, I love the Daisy dogs. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what they're missing. So they just need to take a step back and realize these dogs are incredible and they're beautiful. They come in such a variety of colors mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, yeah. hair textures and even sizes and um, yeah. The size yeah. of variations. So I visit the shelter, the core shelter at least once a week and I went yesterday and what you said about soul feeding. Yeah. Every mm -hmm. time I go there, I'm just like, my heart is full. So it's, it's yeah, I know yeah. I need, I need to get back there bad. You <laughs> 
come back to me. Come back I, to me. I, I'd love to. I'm, I'm waiting for things to get, get better, you know, in the pandemic. Yeah, but yeah, sure. it's, it's, I am, I've been actually saving money for my next trip. So yeah, <laughs> I'll be work. back. <laughs> but yeah, so as far as the older dogs or the dogs that, you know, might have some special needs, again, to me, that is, I, that's what I look for. I look for the, the, three-legged dogs or the handicapped dogs or the dogs with one eye or the dogs that can't see at all. Those are my, I love those types of dogs. Um, and so, you know, puppies and they're uh, by their own right are just, you know, they're puppies and that's a different journey you're taking with a dog. But if you get an older dog, gosh, you know, housebreaking is a non-issue and they, they come kind of sort of, you know, a little bit more easier to, uh, it, in in bring into your home and adjust with sometimes you know puppies yeah. are great don't get me wrong but the older dogs definitely have their their perks so you know when i foster i actually prefer adult dogs um i mean i feel like oh i mean i'm both have their own challenges I, yeah, sure, oh, yeah. But like with uh with a puppy a puppy's personality is still developing so yes, a puppy's is. personality will grow based on you know their genetics, what they're exposed to, what the training mm -hmm. they receive, so many things. With an older dog, sometimes one thing that you do get is that you have an idea of the personality that is already developed. So you right. know a little bit more easier maybe what to give that dog, what that dog needs from you from the beginning. Right. So I, I love older dogs. Uh, Me too. I like the adult yeah. dogs. And But I say that, but on the I was actually thinking about trying to set up to the point where I can do a mama and some babies. That's a whole oh, new, yeah. that's a whole new, uh, like we talked about preparation earlier yeah, uh, yeah. For, for fostering. That's a whole different kind of preparation. And, and so I've kind of walking around my house going, where could I put a whelping box <laughs> someplace, you know, where a mom and dog can have her babies and, you know, peacefully and quietly without a lot of chaos around the house. And I've been, I'm thinking about it. So <laughs> I say I like the older dogs, but I'm really entertaining the fact of maybe doing some pregnant mamas here before too long. It's good to have new experiences though. I mean, like True. see w where you can help, what you can learn. I think it's great. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So our next question, which I think we have in a way kind of covered, why foster a desi dog? <laughs> so <laughs> they're so awesome. <laughs> Let's let's talk about why people should foster Daisy dogs. <laughs> well, why people should foster Daisy dogs in India is definitely because of the need. I mean, these dogs are so deserving. They are just so deserving of of homes and people that care for them. Um, and, and there and there's just so many of them. So and you know you think oh well you know one dog what difference is that going to make? It makes it makes a big difference not just to that dog but um, again, with the, the, the ripple effect of, you know, somebody might say, Hey, you know, what started you doing this? And they might, it might perk an interest in them. And then, and then it just kind of, it grows and it spreads. Um, so one dog becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, you know, that end up in foster homes. And not only that, if they're brought off the streets, you know, again, sterilization, you know, spay and neuter, again, you get spay one female you neuter one male how many generations are you preventing from the cycle continuing right right and i mean in india when puppies are born on the street you can't you can't guarantee their survival you know you you don't know what's going to happen with them it's it's a very sad situation so uh, that's definitely something that I wish people would kind of keep in mind more. Yeah, so, yes, definitely. So, you know, by fostering, you know, one dog and that dog gets the medical treatment that it needs, it gets, it gets you know, again, sterilized. Yeah. And um, how many generations of, of homeless, you know, dogs, street dogs that are trying desperately to survive in, in the world do you prevent? Right. Um, so... I mean, from my end, when um, I think you addressed like one of the key facts, which is the need, you know, like it is genuinely something that is required because I mean, animal welfare people in India, whatever else may happen, I think really work hard. Like, you know, like you have so much thrown at you all the time and you're constantly trying to like keep yourself up and make sure that good work is happening. So I think it, the, the need of the R definitely is fostering. And it just allows us to do so much more. And I think what you said about Desi dogs earlier, like they have their own unique personalities and quirks. It's so true. So I adopted a Desi puppy earlier this year. 
uh, I told my parents, let's do an older dog because I was just like, oh, all the poop and the pee and the, <laughs> you know, all the potty training and uh, nobody listens to me. <laughs> so he's uh, like, he just grew up to be this, uh, he's such a goofball. And then I see him like trying to be confident and then getting scared of shadows. And he's just like, <laughs> he's just he's just the sweetest you know like you you get like this entire personality that you know i don't i mean uh, not that breed dogs are not excellent in their own i'm sure like they have positive traits but with desi dogs i'm just like you're you're getting such a character out of that like that dog is such a character they they really do have these very complex personalities again not to you know i i love my dachshund more than you know you can imagine um so i'm not at all uh saying that domestic dogs are you know not they're wonderful they're wonderful but there's just something about these these daisy dogs and their quirks you know and that's the best way to put it they're just they have these little quirks in their personalities um that again are so entertaining and and they they do keep you they they keep they keep you laughing they you know every time you think yeah. you've seen seen it all they come up with something new and and um they're 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 pretty they're pretty amazing dogs they are they are i wish i wish people would kind of look beyond the entire the breed aspect of it if you kind of look at a dog as just a dog as a as a being you know you see its personality and everything without the idea of breed i feel like that would that would that would help so much with the work well you know and again it gets back to this dog that i picked up last night this little chihuahua she's seven years old she has spent her whole life in this little tiny box because somebody wanted a purebred you know, it's, you got to get past all that. And I'm all about breed preservation. I'm not saying, you know, I think that, you know, having, having, you know, preserving the breeds that we have is certainly important, but when you're spending $150 or whatever on a, on a Chihuahua that was bred in a box, you need to take a step back and think about that. You know, when there's all these amazing dogs out there that, that, that will bring so much to your life. Um, so. Absolutely. So uh, we've talked a lot about our foster based community and the network you create and, you know, um, how it kind of kind of lifts you up. It, it allows you to do more, the importance of that. Uh, so I'm going to pass through that one because I feel like we have gone over it and go on to your personal foster stories because we know that there are some very interesting ones. So we were supposed to have a slideshow, but because of some technical difficulties, we're not going to be able to show the pictures up here. But I would. Uh oh, Swati. I'm thinking. Speaking of technical difficulties, I think you just went away. But that's okay. Um, I got the gist of the question, which was personal stories. Hi, you're back. Hi. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Just disappeared for a second. That's. That wasn't long, actually. I thought I was going to fly solo for a while. So, no. I, so, were you finished with your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we don't, because we are lacking a slideshow, which is fine. So, yeah. um, personal dogs, foster dog stories. Um, well, I can, I told you about the one, his name is Monty now, that came here that was so sick. But um, there was one super special one, and that was Hope. And she came from Carl. She was a street dog and she had, um, it's debatable uh, whether it was a birth defect with her hind legs or an accident that happened to her on the street. Um, once we got her here and her current adopters had taken her to the vet, he thought as though, you know, her, the lack of use in her hind legs was a deformity, was a birth defect, but who knows. But at any rate, she was a street dog in India um, and she had a litter of puppies and um, she was rescued by call. She was in in kind of some of the, the first generation dogs that went, yeah, went yeah, to call yeah. for rescue. Um, so they, they brought her in. At, well, they went to go get her off the street and she literally, you know, took them to where her, her puppies were. So they were able to take her and her litter into their care. And um, Hope spent a lot of time at call. I don't know, Swati, you might know, was she there three years? Yeah. Okay, so she was at least three years because I met two of her sons yesterday, and they are between four and five now. Oh, okay, all right. So yeah, so she was there longer, obviously, than that. Mm. Um, and I had come to India in two thousand 
19, sorry, this world, this, this, this year has been kind of a blur uh, to pretty much to all of us. And I met Hope there. Um, and she was the greeting committee. Oh my gosh, she was amazing. And, and, and I was just, and it just got me thinking, I was thinking to myself, okay, you know, Operation Paws for Homes does bring in tripods and they do bring in, you know, a variety of dogs, but would a dog like Hope have a chance of getting adopted? Um, you know, truly disabled dog. She had no use. She, she could stand on her hind legs, but that was it. She, you know, didn't didn't have much use of them at all. And um, so I kind of started campaigning, you know, and trying to convince the powers that be to let her come over. And they were supportive, and they said yes. And and Hope came um, in December. Not, yeah, December. 2019 gosh again yeah every, everything's a blur right? you know I'm like this this so she <laughs> came, it, 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 it just seems like so long ago but actually it's not been that long at all um and she came here and um she just you know truly cannot if there is a dog that brings light everywhere she goes it, it's hope her name fits her everything about her is just you know she's just this ray of light um so she came in December 2019 and um, took some practice and stuff, but I introduced her to a wheelchair and, you know, at first she was like, what the heck is attached to my rear end? <laughs> you know, she, like, she wasn't overly thrilled with it, but over some practice and some time, she's like, once she, they, they have this aha moment, it's like, it's like the light bulb just goes pink and right. just off she went. And I was like, and off we went, you know, <laughs> so, and, and amazingly in no time at all, um, well, not amazingly, it was a wonderful thing, but a little sad for me. She was adopted in three weeks and Aww. she got this amazing home about an hour away from my house um, with an incredible family that just absolutely love her. And again, you know, she, the light, you know, and that's what they tell us all the time. She's just brought so much light and joy into our lives. Um, and behind Hope, uh, the next handicapped dog that came to be here uh, with me is, is Pihu, who ultimately I ended up it keeping and you heard her story earlier she's the the double amputee that suffered spinal fractures as a puppy um and again with the wheelchair learning learning the wheelchair uh, the first couple of times she's like what you doing back there you know and then when they have this aha moment she had the same thing this aha and it was like i can move i can move fast and you know and boop all she went like i said i'm to take up running to keep up with her but she's amazing i mean steps don't stop her we go out into the woods and you know trees and logs. I mean, she's just like I call it monster truck. You know, she just threw through it all. So she's she's pretty amazing. So yeah, I, I love seeing Bihu's pictures. Like, <laughs> I, I, I just love them. They just make me so happy. She's she's well. Wonderful. We have a holiday here. It's called Halloween, where we dress our kids up and sometimes ourselves and. <laughs> yep, our dogs too. And so I dressed her up as kind of a mermaid looking thing. I made this tail for her and <laughs> I made a special vest that. that goes on her that I can hook her wheelchair to. So I yeah. saw that. that. That was beautiful. I think we posted about that as well. Yeah. Because we were so excited. We were just like, see who is a mermaid. <laughs> she, she tolerates a lot from me. She just she's like, why, mom? Why? Why? Because <laughs> it makes me happy. <laughs> so, yeah. And then so after you, did you had there was there was one more dog you had talked about uh, earlier um bugs bugs that was Mont bugs bugs bunny was his rescue name he was the one um i said came to me was so sick and i was so sure that he would have been okay, that dog yeah. that would have been put down um so no oh, no swati there you are i'm having trouble hearing you say it again um Right, uh, the senior dog, not the so senior. Like, say it one more time. I almost got it all. The six, seven year old dog with heartworms. That yes, that he's the one I had talked about earlier. So you know, he he again. I just I'm sure that he would have been one of the ones that would have been euthanized in in um the the uh, SPCA that he was in or the, the shelter he was in down South. Um, our rural shelters really suffer for funding. Um, so he was an older dog and he considered older cause he was like six or seven. He was surrendered by his owner. Um, he had heartworms and again, heartworm is a, a, a parasitic infestation. You know, it's in the pulmonary system. So the vascular system. So it literally goes, it clogs up their heart. These worms get in your, it's disgusting. Um, 
so he had this this parasitic infestation along with a just terrible sinus infection in his head and he was so miserable when he got here um he is he's absolutely one of my favorite rescue stories um but his name, his rescue name was Bugs Bunny. And then ultimately he did get a Bugs Bunny. I think we were doing the bunny rabbit theme because we do themes when we do, you know, our, our transports, we have themes and he was part of the, the bunny theme. So he was Bugs Bunny. Um, so he ended up getting healthy here with me and he went on to be adopted by this wonderful girl. And I get lots of pictures and videos of him. Um, she lives near a lake um, up north and he loves the water. He loves to chase balls. He's even made a friend. It's a, a lab um, Labrador retriever. That's his friend. And just, just this, to see him evolve from this incredibly sick dog that could barely move around my kitchen when he came to a dog that's out chasing balls and, and having a good time um, is no doubt in my mind that if OPH hadn't been, you know, willing to take him into the rescue and do the treatment for the heartworms that he, he would have been euthanized at the, at the shelter he was in. That's, yeah, that, that, I mean, it, it really just shows how fostering saves lives. It's, it's a great story. For it it does. So, I mean, you know, it made me happy to save him, obviously made him very happy. And then this girl <laughs> just adores him. She, you know, and she got him right before the pandemic started. So he's been her buddy, you know, during shutdown and everything. So, you know, it's not just one life you're saving. Sometimes it's the adopters. Their lives are turned around yeah. by the dogs coming into their lives. So definitely. So we do have a couple of questions. Uh, we also, we talked so much. <laughs> I just realized that oh, we were supposed to do 15 minutes of questions. Um, well, we have but... four minutes. One, two, three, go. <laughs> So we're going to go with uh, Seema's question over here. What, how does one know for how long we, one may need to foster? What if your situation changes while you are fostering? Um, it, your situations absolutely can change. Um, but if you're going to, if you're going to plan on fostering, you, you really shouldn't have an expectation of time length because if it goes over that, you'll be disappointed or you'll, you, or you'll, you know, well, this wasn't what I signed up for, or but shorter, like with hope, you know, I was like, Oh, she's leaving already. You know? <laughs> so um, really, just go in it with the expectation of you're going to have this pet, and you and this pet are going to take a journey together. And then at some point, this pet is going to move on and their journey is going to continue with somebody else. Um, as far as situations changing, which absolutely happens, um, you know, with Operation Pause for Homes, they, you know, you contact them, and they'll find the dog, a new foster. Um, because we have a huge network of fosters, we're able to do that. Call might struggle with that and might have to end up taking the dog back to their shelter. Um, so, but you know, it, it happens, you know, unforeseen circumstances do occur, but ideally, you know, you're going into it with, you're taking a journey with this dog until the dog's journey continues with a new family. Right, and it can be a short amount of time. You know, I don't know how fast dogs get adopted in India. I can tell you here, um, we have a minimum seven day stay. Um, some of the dogs are, are adopted out quickly. They're more desirable type dogs. People want the littler ones. They tend to go faster. Yeah, um, yeah. But I don't go into it going, well, you know what? Time's up, buddy. You're out. You know, it's like, <laughs> so I go into it knowing this dog is going to be with me for their journey until the journey continues with their adopter. Great, great. So, I mean, I mean, you know that one of the reasons we do international adoptions is because there's a very slow and sometimes non-existent adoption rate over here. So we we also like our puppies tend to have like more requests or like our purebred dogs. And as you know, God does work mainly with Desi dogs. God was started to work with Desi dogs. So we have very few purebred dogs. Uh, so they tend to have better luck. But uh, one of the reasons actually that we are not, um, we don't have such a, uh, active foster system right now is because we don't want the situation where someone takes a dog home and then the dog comes back to the shelter because we we feel like it's happened like a couple of times and then we were like you know this is painful for the dog like this is they they don't deserve to go through this it was uh maybe it wasn't thought through from one end and it, it's just an unnecessary burden that's kind of added for them so when now when we're going like when we look at fostering we look at it as uh if this dog is going for a foster, it's only going to a permanent home after this because you're you're teaching the dog to live in a home and then you're taking that away. Well, that's yeah, that's the idea. I mean, you know, 
get get the dog into a foster home and then get them into a permanent home. Again, circumstances change even from the adoption end, but uh, you try to keep that to a minimum. It's, it's, they're not expendable. They're not something you take back to the store. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's an animal. It's in, and believe it or not, it has feelings. It has anxiety. It has happiness. Um, so, and it depends on you. It's kind of, it, it is dependent on you. Yep, for its absolutely. Care, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think this has been, we're, we're almost hitting 60 minutes. Sorry. I'm very, <laughs> so we're not going to take any other questions, but I feel like we've covered a lot today. And I really hope that everyone who watches this, watches any part of it, learns a little bit more about fostering. And I really hope that we are able to develop the kind of foster system that you guys have over there, because it's one of the incredible things that, you know, kind of sets OPH apart in my mind, the, the amazing foster network you guys have, the amount of, individual attention each dog gets through you so it will come you, so you know it took oph time it'll take you time but it will come we're we're working hard at it <laughs> yeah i know, know. <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah thank you so much for doing this uh again this is jill from operation pause from homes and i am uh swati kankan from kanan animal welfare uh thank you so much everyone who's joined us today and well, a uh, good night from my end and a uh, good, good morning. Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like from 9.30 your... in the morning here. So, all right. It was yeah. great talking to you. Thank you so much you. for giving me this opportunity. We're so glad you were with us. All right. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. Thanks Bye. For